Welcome to today's EMN5. Today we are going to be talking about acute chest and sickle cell disease, one of the most catastrophic complications of this disease process. Think about the last sickle cell patient you saw. Now think about your differential for the same patient. Odds are the differential diagnosis went something like this. Vaso-occlusive crisis, 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 and finally, acute chest syndrome. Today, we're bringing acute chest syndrome to the forefront, and we're going to be discussing why this disease is so important and needs to be considered in every patient with sickle cell disease. Approximately 50% of all patients with sickle cell disease will be unfortunate enough to experience acute chest. Furthermore, this disease has a 12% mortality. This makes this the leading cause of death from sickle cell. You will encounter this disease in the emergency department, and it is very important to understand how to diagnose and care for this disease. So, what is acute chest? Is this acute chest? And if so, why is it so deadly? This is not acute chest. Let's start with the definition of acute chest in sickle cell disease. Acute chest syndrome is a two-part definition, a new radiographic infiltrate, as pictured in the left lung field of this chest x-ray, combined with any of the following. Fever, greater than 2% drop in O2, PaO2 less than 60, tachypnea, accessory muscle use, chest pain, cough, wheezing, or rails. As you can see, the definition for the second half of the diagnosis is quite long. It is important to remember that acute chest can be defined by a generous amount of parameters. The most convenient way to think of this entity is the following a new radiographic infiltrate, plus any cardiopulmonary symptoms. By using this convenient classification system, this will increase your ability to recognize and rapidly treat acute chest syndrome. Now that we understand that acute chest is a new radiographic infiltrate, plus any cardiopulmonary symptoms, let's talk about how this entity occurs. Acute chest syndrome is a result of a complicated and multifactorial process, which starts with vaso-occlusion. There are two types of vaso-occlusion, intrapulmonary and extrapulmonary. Intrapulmonary vaso-occlusion can occur from asthma, hypoventilation, fluid overload, or infection, with chlamydia being the most common species. Extrapulmonary vaso-occlusion can occur from bone marrow necrosis or fat emboli. Vaso-occlusion within the pulmonary vasculature results in hypoxia, release of inflammatory cytokines, and acidosis, which in turn feeds back and causes more vaso-occlusion within the pulmonary vasculature. So, how do we diagnose acute chest? This comes down to three pieces, taking a careful history combined with a focused physical exam and, most importantly, pursuing appropriate imaging to make this diagnosis. When taking a history and considering the diagnosis of acute chest, there are multiple risk factors for this disease. The most important is prior history of acute chest syndrome, as this has an 80% recurrence rate. Patients may complain of any of the following, fever, cough, chest pain, shortness of breath, chills, wheezing, or hemoptysis. And, as always, pay attention to vital signs. Fever followed by tachypnea is the most common sign, as it occurs in 80% of the patients with acute chest syndrome. So be very, very careful when you see fever in your sickle cell patients. Although rows and wheezes are frequently noted as physical exam findings associated with acute chest syndrome, the reality is that the most common physical exam finding is a normal physical exam. In fact, 35% of patients with acute chest syndrome have normal physicals. This is why pursuing imaging is very important. Any sickle cell patient with a respiratory complaint has bought themselves a chest x-ray, regardless of their respective exam findings. However, a normal chest x-ray does not absolve your patient of having acute chest. The sensitivity of a chest x-ray has been reported to be as low as 85% when diagnosing acute chest. So, what to do with a normal chest x-ray? If you're concerned about acute chest and you're faced with a normal chest x-ray, then CT imaging will be your next study of choice to keep looking for or to exclude a radiographic infiltrate. Lab studies can be helpful in the diagnosis of acute chest. These are the following that are recommended to be drawn. A CBC to look for a leukocytosis or a fall in the hematocrit, a reticulocyte count, blood cultures, and an arterial blood gas, as well as blood cultures. Now that we've diagnosed acute chest, how do we treat this entity? Well, there are five interventions that are considered the mainstays of acute chest syndrome. IV fluids, a bolus if the patient is dehydrated, otherwise maintenance is fine. 2. Oxygen, if the oxygen saturation is less than 92% or the PaO2 is less than 70. Antibiotics to cover atypical organisms. Generally, a third generation cephalosporin and a macrolide will be appropriate coverage. Analgesics to prevent splinting and hypoventilation and transfusion. Now, let's talk about transfusion. There are two types of transfusion, simple 
where the patient is given blood, or exchange transfusion, where the patient's blood is exchanged for type and cross-match blood. No literature supports one versus the other, and this is a constant source of confusion when treating acute chest syndrome. This is best handled with expert consultation with a hematologist. Now, let's talk about the three to remember from this week's EM in 5. 1. The definition of acute chest is a new radiographic finding, plus any cardiopulmonary symptom. 2. The chest x-ray has an 85% sensitivity, and the physical exam is normal in 35% of these patients. Get the CT if you still suspect acute chest. 3. Remember the mainstays of treatment. 1. IV fluids. Maintenance is fine if they're not dehydrated. O2 to maintain saturations above 92%, a third generation cephalosporin and macrolide, analgesics to prevent splinting, and transfusion, simple or exchange.